gospel. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Okay. I know where you think I'm going with this. I'm going to start preaching about marriage, and I'm not going to. Uh, Marriage is a pretty straightforward thing. Everything that Jesus said, it's true. And so if you have questions about that, see me after. But... What I really want to talk about today uh, is from the epistle or the letter to the Hebrews uh, that we heard read uh, by Mike just a few moments ago. The epistle or the letter to the Hebrews is uh, a very important letter. It is very well written. Uh, We don't necessarily know who the author of it is, but what we have in there is a, a wonderful explanation of what our faith is. What, what our hope and our faith is in, and has been from the very beginning, because this is a very, very old letter. Now, it's certainly written before uh, A.D. 70, right? So a long, long time ago. But in it, we see the author begins to address kind of a problem, and the problem is this. People are not sure whether uh, the person being addressed in the Scripture is Jesus, angels, or people. And we read that psalm together today, and we said, you know, what is man, what is the son of man that you would look on him? Are we talking about one individual? Are we talking about people, generally speaking? Uh, sometimes we see angels spoken of as the children of God, or sons of God. And when we look at the scriptures, and we're not sure exactly how to understand them, it's important that we know how to look for God, how to look for truth, so that we see it clearly. And that is not always as easy as it seems, is it? Now, when you're in school, it seems really hard. But in school, we learn how to uh, identify truth, how we uh, learn to cast aside those things which don't really matter. Hopefully, we learn these things, and we become smarter, and we grow, and we believe that in that intelligence, now we're able to do uh, more things well. We're able to understand difficult and complex ideas. And that's true, right? Up to a degree. Because in school, we generally learn how the world works. That's an important lesson. You don't want to go without that one, for sure. Maybe if you could have one thing, that'd be really high on the list. How does the world work? Because i got to live in this thing. I don't want to make mistakes. I want my life to go well. I want to be happy. Uh, And I want to avoid as much suffering as possible. Definitely having a knowledge of, of the world that you live in is a great thing. But there becomes a problem because God is not the same as the world. God is not our way of explaining what happens in this life that's mysterious. There are people who believe that about God, but those people are wrong. 
And rather than spend our time talking about them, what we want to talk about is the problem that they have, which is understanding what's God? Where do I find him? There is an idea of God, which is true. It's called ubiquity. Have you ever heard of this term? Ubiquity is a great argument. Uh, if you ever want to get in an argument that will never end with somebody about God, let's say at Thanksgiving, which is not too, too far off, here's how you do it. You point out that God is everywhere at all times and in all things. God is uh, in the chair right now, right? And God's in you if you uh, have his Holy Spirit. God's gathered here, uh, or is with us because we're gathered in his name, right? We're two or more gathered. There he is in the midst. God's all over the place. And yet, most of the time in my life, I don't feel like I can find him. I don't feel like he's readily available to me at the dinner table, and I don't feel like he's in the car with me, or I wouldn't hit so many red lights or, you know, be stuck behind that guy. So if God is everywhere and he's ubiquitous, he's in all things, and as the scriptures say, that all things live and move and have their being in God, then shouldn't I be able to see him everywhere? Shouldn't he be very apparent? And of course the answer to that is no, it is for me. And if you've got that sorted out, see me afterwards as well. And I'll talk to the person about marriage and you can talk to me about seeing God clearly in absolutely everything that exists. The problem is that God kind of seems hidden. And God is hidden in this world. God, uh, rather than being found in all places, he is in all places. But he only can be found where he promises to show up, where he promises to make himself visible and known to you and I. Right? There's a problem with that too. And that is this. That's not where I want to look for God. And that's not where you generally want to look for God. But the maxim holds true that those things which we need most in life are more likely to be found where we don't want to look for them. And Jesus is no exception. And when we look for God, when we want to see God, we see God in Christ. When we see uh, in this letter to the Hebrews, the author is saying, hey, it's fitting that God should be found suffering. It's fitting that God should be found uh, in places where we don't normally think of kings and gods in pain and in deprivation. We don't expect to find God hungry. We don't expect to find God without a home, without a place to rest his head. We don't expect to find God betrayed and without friends. And yet in these places, that is where we find Jesus. See, he is always counterintuitively making himself known in this way. And we have a fancy term for it. It's under the sign of the opposite. This is where we must learn to look for Jesus Christ, where we must look to find God if we want to see him reliably, day in and day out. If you want to find God, you must look where he is. And he is always hidden under the sign of the opposite. Well, what does that mean? Okay, we're going to go into it. And I don't know a better way to describe it than to tell you a story. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you a story about me. When I was young, and it's been a while, I was a very chunky young man, okay? Now, I know in these very well-tailored clothes that uh, I've tried, and they're black, which is slimming. That's why we selected black as the priestly garments. <laughs> that uh, I no longer uh, look quite as, uh, as chunky as I once did. Uh, I am lighter now than I was at 13, right? I was uh, a 215-pound, 5'10 kid with legs that were like tree trunks. The legs are still pretty big. You know, you take what God gives you in life. The, the reason I bring this up is once I started high school, I started wrestling, and I lost a, a lot of weight. I got super skinny, and I was strong for the first time ever, and I was good at a sport for the first time ever. You know, I had played football, but I wasn't very good at football. And I started doing wrestling, and all of a sudden, I'm pretty good at wrestling. And uh, it's really hard, and so I got very thin. And so I went from, like, 215 to about a buck 40. And uh, I was, I had the six-pack and the whole shooting match. It's been a long time. But uh, those are the days. But we, uh, I was exuberant about this fact. I really loved the fact that uh, my body was changing what I esteemed to be for the better. 
And I remember my grandfather, uh, who was alive back then, God, uh, God rest his soul, that he came over one day, and I was saying, hey, Grandpa, look at how strong I am. And he was always a very thin man. His nickname uh, was Stick. He used to be an aircraft mechanic. He was so thin he could reach, uh, difficult to reach parts in the airplane and the wings and so forth. Uh, but he was a slender fellow. And he did not look happy that I had lost a bunch of weight. He looked uh, very concerned and maybe a touch upset. And I remember thinking, it's so weird to me because I think this is objectively better. What I'm becoming is, is better than uh, what I was before. Why wouldn't this person who I know for sure loves me dearly, why wouldn't he want to see that in my life? But what I didn't understand is that his reaction hid under its opposite the love and concern that he had for me. That he grew up an orphan. Uh, he grew up being hungry. Uh, he often had a difficult time providing for his family who grew up hungry and poor. He was afraid of being thin. He wasn't looking for that in life. He was looking for the people that he loved and cared about to have what he wasn't able to give himself or his children. This mattered to him. He loved uh, his grandkids, and he wanted them to, to outwardly show the signs of having everything that he would have wanted for them. And his love was in a place that I didn't know where to look for it at that time. And it was perplexing to me. I also have a father whom I love dearly. My father's a great man. If you met my father, you'd like my father. This I'm confident of. My dad uh, is a lot like me, and I'll confess to you, and let my confession of being his son uh, speak for me as well, because I share so much of uh, my personality with him. That when I was a young man, I used to get in trouble. Maybe I got in trouble a lot. Maybe I didn't. It's for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> my old man used to get angry. And he would get angry and seethe, uh, which at first when I was a kid, I was terrified of. And then later, that kind of made me laugh a little bit that I could push his buttons. And uh, <laughs> I know my kids are here too. They're taking notes. And not for confirmation class either. Uh, <laughs> my old man would, would become frustrated with me and my brothers. I have two brothers. Uh, and when he would get upset. He, he would see it. He would be able to talk through his teeth without opening his mouth and speak using primarily our middle names to address us. And I remember th from a young age being afraid and then later on just being upset and angry with what I esteemed at the time was always a disproportionately uh, upset or angry response to whatever happened in life. But I didn't see in the clenched teeth was that all of the frustration was born out of a love for me and a desire for me to have a better life than the path that I was on was going to lead me to. And I didn't see the wisdom in that. And I didn't see uh, what the future would bring, but I believe that he did. And he knew. And he was afraid. And he couldn't stop me. My father's love was hidden under the sign of the opposite for me. Where I beheld anger, uh, in truth, was love that didn't know how to express itself and couldn't bring about the thing that it wanted most in the world, which was good. That, friends, is what the sign of the opposite looks like. Uh, it looks like your mother's frustration and your father's anger. It looks like uh, disapproval. Sometimes it feels disrespectful. But in life, love is often hidden under the sign of the opposite. And it is uh, in this place that you would do well to learn to look for it because it is not uh, that our pathway isn't lit by love in this life, but it's all of the love that you cannot see and all of the light that you cannot see that prevents you from understanding the goodness of God and the love that your neighbor 
your family member has for you. These things are terrible to go without because they make life seem angrier or lonelier or more difficult or more upsetting than it has to be. And so it is as well with our relationship to God because while we um, might be the ones who are angry with God, we might be the ones who are disappointed with God because where we look, we don't see. When we speak, we don't get the response. We don't hear from God the words that we want to hear. We don't see from God the results that we want to see from God. And we look, we wonder, God, I'm doing the right thing. Why isn't it happening? God, I am uh, praying. I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to live a life that you would approve of. God, where are you? And you look for him where you expect to find God, sitting on the throne in heaven and speaking down, casting down light, right? Or maybe lightning bolts if you're doing what's wrong. But instead, Christ is always to be found under the sign of the opposite. And the place to look to find Christ, who is God in his fullness, clothed in human flesh, is always in the cross under the sign of the opposite suffering for your forgiveness being made low so that you could be raised up loving you in ways that you aren't looking for to create you into someone that you aren't sure you want to become yet this is where we find God this is where uh, when you want to find God we don't send you to the chair we don't send you necessarily to your neighbor where God abides in his, uh, in, in his heart as well. We don't send you uh, to any number of places, but rather we send you to the cross. It's in the sign of the cross, in the sign of suffering and death, but life and forgiveness, in the sign of pain and difficulty, that happiness and health and healing and goodness are to be found. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that we are never abandoned. Lord, you have made it good for us. You have made yourself available to us. You have brought yourself here. But you have come to us lowly. You have come to us hungry, suffering, and in pain. But Lord, you have done those things to spare us from them. And so in our words, when, or rather in your words, when we tend to hear your disapproval, remind us of the love that caused you to speak them. And when we imagine you to be stern, remind us of the love that caused you to be clothed in human flesh and to, and to die to bring us to you. We pray these things through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.